these are my drums and this is my way of speaking to you, okay? But I don't say anything with words. I don't say anything with my mouth, but you still know how I feel when I sit down and play the drums. Hi, this is Jeff Grandy again uh, with Journey with Jeff. We're going to continue this episode uh, with our guest from last time, uh, Rob the Drummer. And we want to welcome him back and ask you guys to hopefully you will enjoy continuing the continuing saga and fascinating story of our guest, Rob the Drummer. Just for a minute, just for a minute, don't think. Just for a minute, that little voice that you talk to in your, in your head all the time, the one that you think is you, try not to have it talk to you. Okay, so, so uh, uh, okay. we're, we're at the uh, plant, and we're plant. at Morley School. Yeah, yeah Morley and, Plant and Hall. And you, came, you got to Hall High, yep. and you, were, you got into the jazz band there. I think there were 900 kids in here about that yeah about 900 about my, right. my graduating class was like 300 or 260 same or with mine yeah about yeah. the same yeah yeah and you uh you you got you were not only were you in, engaged in music yeah you also were on the football team i was on the football team i was on the wrestling team i was on the uh, track team I was shot put javelin discus well, so yeah, you were I had wore my leather sweater. You know, I had letters over here. It was wonderful. You know, impressed, very impressed. You know, you might not like my looks, but I got a leather sweater. Does that make me a letter band? Not yeah. really special. Yes, okay, I get it. But music has always been your number one passion. That was the thing. Yeah, in, it the thing naturally in your life. it came out. It just came out. Yeah, it came out. You went, you graduated from Hall. Graduated from what Hall. What happened after Hall High? Where did you go to school? Went to Dean Junior College uh, outside of Boston in Franklin. Yeah. That was the number one junior college in the United States at that point, <coughs> mainly because I didn't quite know what I wanted to do, and it was during the time of the draft. And, um, you know, there were the stress, the stress on kids when they were in the draft. I had a high number, but I will just tell you, I, I have to say something about it. I sitting around the television in the dorm that day when they were giving out the numbers, some people knew they were going because they didn't have the grades that stay out, their 2S uh, determination or whatever. And so um, if you didn't have a high number, you were going. And I lost a lot of friends that never came back. Or if they came back, they weren't the same at all. Because, you know, they, they break you down to nothing and then they build you back up again so that they can use your talents. Um, that's what they do at, at basic. And um, the, the pressure was on uh, for the whole Vietnam thing. And, you know, I was at the first Woodstock. I was about 500 feet from the front. So I was trying to express freedom in the midst of uh, some pretty crazy times. But, yeah, so I went to Dean and it was a great, I started uh, my first, Major was business organization and management because my parents wanted me to get a grounding degree, and that wasn't sitting with me very well. So then sociology was my second semester, and then music was my third semester, but the music program there wasn't so hot. And then my fourth semester was psychology. And um, then they started firebombing the university, and sent us home with our third quarter grades because they couldn't guarantee our safety anymore. That was interesting. And then I went to Quinnipiac because my father had just died and I basically wanted to be near my mom, to tell you the truth. My mother had gone to Syracuse, my brother had gone to Syracuse, my uncle had gone to Syracuse, and I would have gone, most probably, because I, I liked it up there too. It's an amazing, I took I took my mom for her 65th reunion of her sorority and got a chance to see what it would have been like to come out of a big university like that. And they, they just huddled around her. She was like gold, I mean, to have somebody who was um, so uh, fluent and, and able to represent what those years had been afterwards. Because all the girls are sitting there going, you know, what am I going to do? What, what am I doing here? You know, where do I want to go? You know, all of those questions that you ask when you're in college. What did you major in at Quinnipiac? I did the first triple independent major of the college, psychology, philosophy, music, triple major. It had never been done before. It took me five years. It was not easy. 
but it exactly prepared me for going on Sesame Street. When I got on Sesame Street, I said that I had to get ready for this. So, well, you had an advisor who, who guided you through that triple major? A few, and actually, they were there were really three. In it was interdisciplinary, <clears throat> so I needed to, to bounce off. There was a committee set up for me just to be able to do it. And they accommodated that, that's they good. They did. Yeah. And I took some great course, I mean, I think my favorite course of all time, just as, as an aside in college, was Tolkien and Epic Fantasy. I took a course before the Lord of the Rings movies and everything. We read the trilogy, we read The Hobbit, and we analyzed it and we talked about it and, and it was fascinating. And unfortunately it was eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm usually on musician's hours, which means you go to bed at 2 and you get up at 9. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, that, that, there was some wonderful uh, stuff and wonderful folks there. It's become quite a big place now. So you made that work. You got your degree. Yep. And, and then uh, uh, we, you marched. You had all these things, uh, these experiences, the, yeah. the, the drumming and the education, now yeah, you had I, all that under your belt. Now you're marching into adulthood. I got on Arista Records with a guy named Larry Young, okay? So I kept playing. After, after college, I kept playing. So I'm on the road in 1975, and I play Carnegie Hall with a guy named Larry Young. Larry Young played with John Coltrane, Miles Davis, Jimi Hendrix. I mean, you're talking about the best of the best. And I, here I am on tour uh, as, a, as a fresh kind of young guy trying to figure out uh, whether I can keep this going, you know, too, to be a, a performer like this. Unfortunately, he, he died rather early, but we had some adventures. And so from 75 to 78, I played with a, uh, a production uh, after he had passed, I think, with, um, it was called Oh Calcutta, and the manager of the whole thing was from Hartford. It was an interesting play because it was a play where everybody took their clothes off. So, um, <laughs> not the band, but everybody took their clothes off in the play. It was, you know, it was like hair. When they took their clothes off in hair, I mean, it was a big... You know, it caused great media sensation and so forth. But I was on the road with it and uh, having a, a, a wonderful time. And I'll just do another aside, I have to, because I'm a mason and a shriner and a jester. Um, a mason does wonderful things for so many people. They, 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 it's, an it's the oldest fraternal organization in the world, 6,000 years from the Temple of Solomon. Pretty, pretty remarkable. And then a Shriner is a high-level Mason. And then a Jester is a high-level Shriner. And there was a fellow from uh, West Hartford named um, Major Kandarian. Uh, he was the captain of the Governor's Horse Guard. Actually, he was the major of the Governor's Horse Guard, I guess. And uh, one of his uh, sons, Don Kandarian, was one of my best friends. And my grandfather was uh, quite a mason uh, with the Grand Lodge of New York. And so he was dying of cancer. And I said, um, I said, if you get through this operation, I will become a mason. Because I, there wouldn't have been another mason to keep it going. And so over the last year and a half of his life, I gave him some great joy by becoming a mason and so forth. So. Um, why is that a good thing? Because no matter where you are, you can get help if you need help. So I'm playing with Oak Calcutta, and I'm playing in Salt Lake City in, in Mormon territory, all right? And the Bible Belt people come out, okay? They, they're picketing. They're saying, you're not going to do this in our Salt Palace. Salt Palace was like maybe the Bushnell. Well, maybe a little bigger, maybe the Civic Center. Okay, and so there's a line of people, and I'm a long-haired rock hippie drummer, and, and here comes this sheriff, and the sheriff comes along, and he's got these pearl-handled pistols, silver, and his crew cut, and he comes over, and, you know, he's going to talk to me because I'm in the band, and he sees my ring. This is my grandfather's. I had to take it off his finger after he died. This is my great-grandfather's. He sees the ring. All of a sudden, he knows I'm okay. 
I've had a like orientation. He knows I'm all right. He becomes my bodyguard for the whole time. Because? Because the ring? of the ring, because he knows I'm a Mason and that I'm a brother, ultimately, because I wouldn't have been able to get through. They can blackball you for any reason if they don't want you to become a Mason. They didn't. I had the character, so forth. So the point was, this would, I would have never been able to communicate with this guy if it wasn't for the fact that he saw my ring. I think that's fascinating. I, I kind of like that. You yeah, know? it is yeah. very interesting. So this guy became a, an ally. Yes, were, he was my bodyguard. Enemy. Took me to dinner, you know, bought me dinner, did this. I was there for like a week of doing shows. They would get you through the picket line. You know, I couldn't get through the picket line otherwise. That's why he had come to talk to me. And so I love that kind of a happy ending. You know, well, that's inter again interesting. Interesting st uh, study of human behavior. Yes. How how just that one ring can turn an adversary into an ally, and instead of going away be with animosity toward yes, each other, yes, with anger toward each other, uh, and and without even knowing each other, you that's know, right. You don't even know a complete person, stranger, but they're. They're on, the, they're on the wrong side of your beliefs. But that one ring brought you both together, and you both realized that, geez, we're, we're beneath the sheriff's badge. That's right. And beneath the drummer's set. That's right. There's a wonderful human being there who I connect with and who I have really come to like. That's right. During World War II... Series of Americans, they're in, they're in the line of a firing squad. They're about to be killed. One of the people that are there start doing a certain mannerism that only another Mason would recognize. There's a certain thing. I mean, there's secret stuff. All right, so he starts doing this mannerism. The Japanese colonel is up in a window watching, watching the, the firing squad about to execute these people. He sees the movements. He goes down. He pulls the guy out of line. He saves his life. Wow. That's tingly. That's, I mean, that's life and death. That's powerful. That's wow. powerful. So, well, nice, nice folks. They're well, all nice you must folks. Have been, but you must have been to, you know, you must have been very impressive to have been able to get these gigs with these different bands and travel around the country. You must have be, uh, proven yourself to be a very, very capable drummer. You must, must have really impressed a lot of people. If you see the root, the root is my genetics were there. In other words, I could hear where time was pretty well. I was strong. Then I was big and physical, so I could be, when I'm performing, I could, I could do it strongly and well. I think I'm pretty well respected as the a drummer. drummer is always the center of the music. And the drummer is really the conductor of the band. It controls the tempo, the dynamics, the fire, the power. It's the upper part of the swing with the high cymbal. It's all the drums is a very, very important instrument. If you can do that and get paid for it, you're there. You're there because now you're going to have a, a life that... How many people do we know that are, that are working at something they truly hate, that they don't enjoy, and they're doing it for the money? Because why? Because they have to. Because why? Because they got responsibilities going. Because they have kids. Because they whatever. And they're just saying, I'll sacrifice, I'll sacrifice. I'll sacrifice what I would have liked to have done. What happened to my dreams? So I'm trying to be proactive, not look at you. It'd be very easy to get depressed 
right about now with what's going on. I'd, I'd rather look and say, if I'm coming into the world for the first time, if I'm a kid coming into the world and I don't have anything to compare anything to, um, what's the dream? What do I want to do? Part of the reason it's been great as Rob the Drummer shows, when I come in and do a motivational show in a school or a, a college or even a prison, is that you're getting a chance for them to feel what you're talking about and rather, rather than just talking. And it can make all the difference. Like I said, there, there have been people that, that have come back to me 20 years later and said, you're the reason I play. Because you came in and you did this show, you used drums, you, you had this drum set that was clear and fiberglass and it was on this uh, frame that made you look somewhere between a messiah and a UFO. It, said, it was unbelievable. And, and you just knocked my socks off. You were, you were talking about anti-drug, you were talking about anti-bullying, you were talking about all this stuff. But more than anything, I became a player because you knocked me out one to one. I felt who you were. And that was the whole essence of what I started to do. I got on Sesame Street in 80, okay? I was on about six shows. Then I got on Nickelodeon. Then I got on Kids World. I did that three times. I got on a romper room with Miss Molly, Magic Mirror. I did that three times. I was on uh, PM Magazine about nine times, I think. And now I'm on a new show called Ariel Zoe and Eli 2 on NBC and PBS. What, did, did you or do, did you have an agent that that set up these gigs for you? Or no. You? Well, I've got a wonderful PR person that went to Conard, Lynn Rosenblatt. Um, and she, she has really knocked herself out. She's, she was a, a former teacher, so she had the art skills and she has the computer skills. And she saw what I did and really has believed in it from the very beginning. And so um, she's been the one. She even got me. I, I was talking to... Um, Mr. Rogers. <laughs> uh, I didn't actually get to talk to him, but I talked to his producer. And because I, I, as soon as I got on Sesame Street, I, you know, I wanted to, um, I wanted to do as much as I could. I talked to Jim Henson in England for a half an hour and was talking to him about going on the Muppets and playing drums with Animal, okay, which is one of the Muppets. That uh, Sesame Street rents the Muppets from from Henson and from Henson Enterprises, whatever. But the point was that I wanted to go on the Muppets itself if I could. Six months later, Buddy Rich did exactly what I was going to do. I said, you know, if I have to take second fiddle of Buddy Rich, I'll, I'll deal with that. Yeah, I'll, I can do that. But what I was implying is that uh, it can really make a difference when you're at the right place at the right time, you're putting out the right vibe, and you're doing it for the right reasons. And it's also a secondary, and it's probably a very big secondary, you've, you've kind of used your, your, your drumming expertise and your experiences with different, in different areas, Sesame Street and so on, yeah. in front of, to also share with people, like you were saying, your, um, your values. You've been, uh, in other words, a kind of a role model to people, not only as a drummer, but is this guy has got some, uh, this guy's had some experiences, and he's in a wider, wider sense. He's uh, sharing some of his ideas and some of his wisdom and some of his thoughts about life in general. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I'm sure that that's probably been an influence, especially to young people. Well, when I do high schools or I'll do college, you know, especially when it comes to question and answer, I they they want to they want to go into some depth. The younger kids just know what they feel. They just know, what do I feel from this? I mean, because I'm the wrong age. I'm sometimes the wrong color when it comes to like anti-drug and stuff as far as talking about problems and difficulties. The point is, you, it, you, you have to be able to, to figure out how to get under the skin. I can discuss subjects, but younger kids don't want to know about that. They just want to be where they are. That, or they just are where they are. They want pleasure. They don't want pain. Gee, that's hard to figure out. You know, that's what they want. So if you can get a message through, and at the same time you're doing it through something that they're enjoying, 
and, and, and from my point of view, and that's nonverbal so that it doesn't get clouded, they'll accept it. A drummer, you know, when I, when I talk about the, there's a, sometimes a bias, a prejudice, that, that the mother country for drummers is Africa, because that's where so much of it came from. And so, um, so when we're, we're talking about drummers specifically, like, like that stuff, if I would go into a high school or a college, they want to talk about it, but for the younger kids, it's a matter of what they feel. It's just a matter of what they feel. And so if you can get to that spot and get in there, you might be able to cause some actual behavioral change. Yeah, I bet you. Yeah. Well, you probably, uh, I'm sure you have a, a huge memory bank of, of, of uh, experiences and people you've met and things you've done. Are there a few um, outstanding, any, 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 uh, that you can share with us some of your most favorite memories, uh, uh, compelling memories, poignant memories. One of the people that has sponsored me, I, I've, first of all, I've got some wonderful sponsors, and, and it all, it, a lot of it came from West Hartford because the consciousness of some of these people, they got it right away. Um, I was on the wrestling team with David Roth, as a matter of fact, uh, just a wonderful guy from West Hartford. I started to teach his son when he was five years old. His son, he came in at five, and I'm on a little pad set, and he's on a pad set. Uh, it looks like a drum set, but it's all pads, so you can hear everything. And I go, da 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 He goes, da 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 I go, da 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 He goes, da 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 It was just total memory. He's five years old. It's not a matter of him cognating. It's not a matter of him uh, doing something intelligent. It's just a matter of genetics and a gift. So he had the gift. And, and David's a, a wonderful fellow and, and has been very supportive, along with Bob Goldfarb, um, who is so behind the music um, uh, directing and so forth. Haig Shavrudian is one of my best friends. I was in a band called The Great Train Robbery, and he was the leader. But all of these people um, are very supportive and come from adventures that I uh, sometimes have had because they've been able to enable me. But, the, but one of the bigger, um, not bigger, but one of the more interesting, no, it's not even more interesting, a guy named Roger Newton, Dr. Roger Newton, went to high school with me at Hall. And he's the guy who discovered Lipitor. And so he brought me out to Michigan. And I would go out for six weeks for 70 shows. And I would get a chance to see the entire state. I don't know whether you know anything about Michigan, but there's a UP and uh, there's an upper peninsula and a lower peninsula. And um, it's hard to say that word. <laughs> um, and upper is really, uh, a lot of it is no man's land. I mean, it's really spread out. And, and lower is places like Ann Arbor. So I, I play this place called Sault Ste. Marie, way up near the Canadian border. And now they have a Rob the Drummer Day there. Every year at the same time, they have a Rob the Drummer Day they celebrate. And it, it's just so cool. Do you, you know? go there for that? Yeah. Uh, well, I went. I went once, yeah, and just the fact that I know that they are still having it is, is great. It was the Michigan State Police that, that helped me. They would take me to a gig. In other words, I was doing schools, and um, what they were trying to say to the kid was the same thing I was, except they would take it from me because of what, everything that we're talking about, the way that I would uh, be able to get it across. I mean, like anti-drug stuff. Anti-drug stuff in this case being, here's a natural way to change the way you feel. Playing drums, uh, martial arts, uh, dancing, skiing, whatever. Mostly non-verbal experiences. Here's an artificial way. You, uh, you can get drunk, you can smoke cigarettes, you can overdo coffee, you can do all of the illegal stuff, whatever. This is always a gamble. This always leaves you more when you finish and not less. And just to show the clarity between those two, that's the anti-drug part of it. I wouldn't go up and say to them, don't do drugs. I'd say, do this and get to the same place instead. You want to change the way you feel? 
sit down at your drum set for 10 minutes and do it like you mean it, you're going to feel different than you did at the beginning. They know where my heart is. And that's why they accept me. And that's maybe why they accept much of what I say. And what Rob the drummer is talking about is getting high without drugs. When he was 25, Rob began to use his drumming to reach kids after being invited by a former instructor to come and talk to some students. And when I walked in, the kids were wild. They were crazy. But as soon as I started playing, I had the wildest kid. I just had him nailed. He's saying, you can say yes because you have all these options of all these other things that you can do. The drums just draw everybody in because it's loud, it's unique. I think he made a lot of people think about what they do a second time. All right, are you going to support them? Are you ready? Through the years, I've developed the ability, hopefully, to approach them and get that connection and get the defense screens down so that if I then do say something, it actually goes in and it actually may cause some behavioral change. So that's the anti-drug part of it, being able to demonstrate it with drums. I'm just letting that out as far as what goes on at a show. Anti-bullying is about empathy. What's it like to be on the receiving end of what you're putting out? In other words, are you hurting somebody? Uh, and have you been hurt? You know, I, I try to reverse it on them and just say, we talk about their phones, we talk about the pictures that they would send that would make somebody feel bad, and, and the fact that once it's out there, it's out there for good. Once you put out a negative like that, and it's on the media, and it's on the, the waves, it'll come back to haunt you because somebody's got a record of it because there are people watching all the time. Isn't that what so many of these religious and philosophical leaders have tried to impart and teach for thousands of years now uh, in terms of... of uh, you get back what you give out, you mean? Of empathy, yeah. And be, being, trying to be empathic and put yourself in another person's shoes and the, the, the walk in another in another person's shoes. Yeah. Isn't that one of the main teachings of, you go back to Moses or Abraham or Jesus or Buddha, um, the, the, the Hindu vo yogins and uh, Muhammad. Absolutely. Uh, are, don't they all have that thing in common of... of uh, yeah, but look what you said to me before. Look at, look, look at the people that are doing it right now that are saying the right thing and that are doing something completely different. Well, that's, yeah, that, and that's, that's the problem, Rob. The, yeah. the, 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 you know, you can, what, what you preach and what you try to preach and what you try to teach, it's only, it's only as good as what you, as your actions that follow it. As the example. And the example. And I right. think that you would agree that, that, that uh, this is a, mainly a Christian country, so I use Jesus as an example, mm -hmm. but you could throw Buddha and, and tons of other people in there. Sure, um, at least tons. Uh, uh, people who, they walked the walk, they talked the talk, and they walked the walk. There was no conflict in how they, how they, what they thought, what they said, and how they acted, and, and what they did. And I think that's the proof of the pudding, is to, uh, is is to is to be able to get have, you know, uh, combine those two. And, and you live your life according to that. We could very easily get into a, p uh, a political conversation right now well, about, we won't. about yes. the brilliant people well, that uh, end up uh, perhaps making interesting decisions. But uh, yes. uh, from a kid's point of view, they don't know about any of this. They don't want to know about any of this. The point is, what um, they ultimately come to it with what's in this for me. What's in this for me? And the point is, if you can make something pay off for them, if I can get a student, I teach privately. I have my own studio. Plus, I play with four or five bands when I'm back here. And then I'm doing Rob the Drummer shows in whatever school system I, uh, in New England or, or even West Coast. So, but the point is, um, if you're trying to get a student to want to put himself into a room for half an hour, and just work on something, you have to answer that question, what's in it for me? And if you can get him to work on something that, in fact, he couldn't get 
originally. I mean, stuff like with what each hand, each foot. I mean, it's very hard in the beginning, but if you can make it pay off for him in 10, 15, 20 minutes, then he may just go in and start practicing on his own. Yeah. And that's the, that's the thinking. That's well, what they did for me. I'm just passing it on down the line. Well, what's in it for me is, uh, I mean, we all operate from a, a self-interest, you know, what's in it for me. Sure. But uh, if, if, it, if, if it can be, what's in it for me is not so much some material gain or power over other people, but what's in it for me is the intrinsic pleasure of having done something that's worthwhile, that's worthy, uh, that, that makes me feel good. And you'll want to do it again, right? And, yes, and, and the Greek philosophers talk about, they talked about uh, an, an avaricious selfishness and a, an altruistic selfishness. You know, you, you do it because it just makes you feel good, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, and, 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 you know, hopefully, hopefully you will get to a point where sharing with other people, showing the love to other people, uh, interacting with this beautiful, warm glow of, of love and sharing and empathy, that makes me feel good. And you'll yeah, want to go back and live. You'll go back and you'll want to go back and do whatever that is again. Yes. So yes. now the contrast is that when we were talking about the people that are doing a job that they absolutely hate and they're doing it for the money. So now how do you feel? Now are you going to want to go in and you're going to want to go in and do that as an activity of your life? I don't think so. Good point. You know, so yes. the point is the whole idea of Avon and Simsbury and West Hartford is to provide an environment where kids can flourish because they figure it out. They figure out the fact of what do I want if they can figure it out early and how am I going to go about it? And a lot of the time here, because of their upper middle, they, the parents will enable them to be able to go after their dream. And it's terrific. It's absolutely terrific. That's a very, very good point to end this on. We're almost out of time. Okay. But you're, that phrase really is a powerful phrase to provide an environment where the kids can flourish. And that, that's, that's, that's Maslow. That's self actualization Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's all, all of the great thinkers are, and, and even, even a, lot of, a lot of cultures, and there are some countries some are doing a better job than others, is, is let's try to develop an educational system, a political system that, that helps kids who are brought into this world by no, by totally by accident, let's provide, let's value them enough to give them the opportunity to flourish and bloom and become that, that rose, that, that beautiful, that beautiful organism mm -hmm. that they were meant to be. Mm -hmm. And you were fortunate because you had that gift and you lived in an environment that allowed you to That's right. cultivate that and to experience that and to live that and to love that. And look what, it's, look what kind of a life you've lived. Yeah. You're a perfect example of providing an environment where kids can flourish. Look how Rob the Drummer has flourished. Thank you. And we should all be very appreciative of that. And we do have, uh, I want to just ask you, what, uh, Rob, just aside here, what is the best, what's the best book you've ever read? Wow. Is there one book that you've read that really kind of, uh, wow, that was really something. I really like the Dan Brown stuff, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Okay. Um, um, you know, all of the, uh, the adventures. Wow. The one that really knocked me out? Well... I must say, given the life stage I was at, the teachings of Carlos Castaneda, all of that in the 60s, 60s to 70s, um, he, was a, um, he was an anthropology student for the University, I think, of Arizona, and he became a brujo, a, uh, a, a, an Indian wizard. Um, he, he apprenticed bec uh, for medicinal plants and he, he apprenticed, and the adventures and his, his descriptions of what he was feeling and thinking, that was pivotal uh, for many of us.
Uh, he wrote some good books, the Yaki, yeah. the Yaki Way of Knowledge. Way of knowledge. And I know That's there's it. a couple of other ones. Yep. And we do have, we do have a, a, a very illustrious uh, studio audience here with us. Yes, and, uh, why uh, young Dan Berman is here. Well, my executive producer, Dan Berman. <laughs> yes. Mr. Robert Radin, a great physicist. I love uh, that. Mr. Mark Rubenstein. Yes. One of the great authorities on the Course of Miracles. Yes, 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 yes. Is, and, and we have a, a lot of other people over here, uh, but these three are... Uh, do you guys uh, have any... Uh, as you've listened to this, would you like to ask Rob a question before we close? Does anybody have yeah, a comment or a question? This should be after the show, but um, yeah. what it intrigued me is something I got involved in a long, long time ago, which is I wrote a book on it. I learned. Speak up, Bob. This is something I got involved in a long, long time ago. I wrote a book called Full Potential. And what, it, what it's about, I, I didn't invent it, but I learned it. And uh, what it's about is discovering thousands of skills that people have that they don't know they have. There's every mechanism for doing that, focusing goals. And then learning, it's got an app, a practical application, learning how to navigate the world of work in a, in a, in a, in a uh, how do you, I want a copy. Productive. I want to read it. And uh, how to market yourself with a proposal. But for the kids, I've often wanted to, it's on Amazon, but it's long out of print, but I have a, a, a how do I say it? I, I reissued it myself in, in a different, different title, but I could get, I, we could, but I'd be interested and seeing if I could use some of these techniques so kids can discover their, their skills. I'm, I'm talking about talents, particularly, mm -hmm. where, where you, you learn to do, you do something that you do gracefully and beautifully and never remember having had to learn how to do it because it comes naturally. Mm. Well, thank you for that, for that comment. I have to do a shout out to Dan Berman's son, Andy, because Andy was my drum student for a few years, and he was so kind, he gave me a gift at the end, I think, of his, uh, of his taking lessons. He, he made a mirror in shop, and it had my Rob the Drummer logo that I, that I have. Uh, he, he painted it by hand on this mirror, and he gave it to me, and I had never been given anything like this, and was knocked out because I didn't expect it. And it was the kind of uh, camaraderie and warmth that goes on between a teacher and a student, but it was also the acorn not falling far from the tree, and that's why I'm so glad to, to have Dr. Dan Berman over here, <laughs> the executive producer of your show. That's all I can say. Yeah, he's very good. And, and, and Mark Rubenstein like is right here. Mark has been a wonderful mentor. He's, uh, we have the mutual friend of uh, Igor Sikorsky. Igor helped me get to Russia doing Rob the Drummer shows uh, a couple times. And uh, just a remarkable fellow. And he loves him. And I love him. And so I love him. And so does a, it's a love fest. Dave, Dave <laughs> you have a couple of minutes left? OK, wind it up. OK. Uh, yes, I'd like, uh, Rob, could you give a uh, synopsis of your spiritual um, or religious paths uh, over the course of your life? Sure. Sure. you got about one minute. Okay, so um, I was bar mitzvahed in Bethel Temple. I was the first one to ever be bar mitzvahed in the huge new sanctuary. So it was a big deal. I had extra stuff to say in Jewish and uh, Hebrew, and they brought uh, rabbis from Israel, and it was a big deal. And then I got confirmed, and then I got post-confirmed. Post-confirmed was a Rabbi Kessler for those in West Hartford, and he took us to a Buddhist service. He took us to a Quaker service. He took us Catholics, uh, Protestants, whatever. So brought up Jewish, obviously, and uh, then um, because of my, what, my exploration with my thesis for that triple major, the triple independent major, was the psychological, philosophical, and aesthetic dimensions of human growth patterns with special emphasis on self-transformation. So that was quite the something, and certainly for a BA to be working a thesis like that. But um, so that led me into uh, moving more into not necessarily learning liturgy, learning uh, written words supposedly from God, 
but going directly to the source. In other words, did you need a middleman to go to God? Do you need somebody in between? I mean, some people do. They, they want Jesus, they want Buddha, they want Muhammad, or do you want to try to go direct? Since your life was given by some force, and that force is going to end when it leaves, and you've got to decide who were you before and after. And so you start asking these very heavy questions, which is nice to go to college to have the time to figure that out, because you sit up all night talking about all of this stuff with everybody. But the point is, um, that's when you start opening up into what ways you are going to approach it. And of course, in miracles, I have found uh, these folks are, are just great because they're not afraid to say that uh, many of the previous ways of approach just haven't worked for them. And, uh, you know, they're, they're suggesting that you look outside the box, really look outside the box. And uh, it's an extreme box, and it's probably circular. I don't know. Anyway, but um, the spirituality comes from realizing where your root was genetically from your family and then the kind of nurturing environment you were in, and that includes West Hartford and Hall High School. And then you go out and you offer your spirit in the best way you can see it. Mine has been through drums and through direct nonverbal exchange of emotion and feeling. I try to make the audience feel what I'm feeling when I'm playing. Rob the Drummer, thank you very much. Thank you, young man. Thank you, studio audience, for your, your questions. Very nice, nice guy, you nice, wonderful, you. nice guys. I wanted to say uh, to the folks who are viewing that uh, I hope that you found this uh, stimulating uh, as I have. And uh, thank you for your questions, people in the studio audience. Very nice. Uh, Rob, thank you again very much. Pleasure, and pleasure. I hope that you guys will uh, continue watching and keep tuning in to Journeys with Jeff. And until next time, you take care. <laughs>